So we have to talk about the shift in focus from what was important during the medieval era to what was important during the Renaissance era. Now, if you've ever been to the Louvre in France, this is a fantastic historical uh, walk that you can take, and you can go through these eras and see how things change. It's a fascinating thing to do. I've been to the Louvre five different times, still haven't even come close to seeing everything. Uh, so it would take a long time to see everything at the Louvre, but it is fascinating to look at art history to see how it reflect, reflected history at the time. So what we're going to talk about now is what was that shift in focus. Medieval art often was religious based and oftentimes it was Christian religious based. So a lot of the art you're going to see from the Renaissance is number one going to be two dimensional. There's not a lot of depth, there's not a lot of shadowing, there's not a lot of perspective in uh, medieval art, but that's going to change during the Renaissance. The concept of depth and shadowing and using colors to bring focus, that's a Renaissance ideal. So what I would do if I was in class is I would draw a square, and the square would represent medieval art, two-dimensional, and then I'd make that square a cube by giving it depth. And in doing so, I'd show you the big change that happened in art during the Renaissance. So you have this perspective, you have foregrounds, you have backgrounds, very important concept there. Now humanism, this is focusing on worldly subjects rather than religious issues. That's not to say the people in the Renaissance were not religious, it's just they shifted their focus to human beings. And the human form became very important to the artists of the Renaissance. And you can see right here, I have what's called the Vitruvian Man, which was drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. And keep in mind, doing research on anatomy was illegal back then. The concept of doing an autopsy or cutting open a cadaver to see how everything worked, that was illegal. That was 100% illegal during this time period. So da Vinci had to work out some shady deals with some grave robbers and some grave diggers to get access to cadavers so he could study the human form. Now here's what I would do if this was in class, but you could pause the video to do this as well. What I would do at this point is I would show you the symmetry of human beings and then that not everybody is symmetrical, but if you were to stick out your wingspan like this and measure from fingertip to fingertip, most people on planet Earth, that distance from fingertip to fingertip is also the distance from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Now, there are exceptions. There are people that have shorter wingspans. There are people that have longer wingspans. Those people that have longer wingspans tend to be very good at specific sports like basketball. Kevin Durant is 6'9". His wingspan is 7'1". So he's got a gigantic wingspan and he's not symmetrical which is a benefit to Kevin Durant. But you can see when he walks that his arms look longer than they should. So, Da Vinci studied the human body and made a lot of discoveries about the human body throughout this time period. And Da Vinci was a once in a generation genius, once in a generation. He did everything during the Renaissance where some Renaissance thinkers and inventors and writers only did one specific field. Da Vinci was doing everything. Now, again, the medieval art, religious based. Renaissance art, human based. Now, Renaissance art also used perspective. What perspective means is it has depth. Clearly, if I draw a cube, it's still two-dimensional, but it plays a trick on your eyes where it looks like it has depth. Now, there were many geniuses during this time period. It's a very unique time period in history where you have multitudes of individuals achieving great things. Once in a generation type thing. So it's a remarkable time period. And you'll notice these names, very similar, if not identical, to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, where do you think those names came from? So, when we have these geniuses of the Renaissance, we have to attach what they did to it. So you're going to see these paintings that I have here. The top one is The Last Supper. That's by Leonardo da Vinci. The middle one is the roof of the Sistine Chapel, which was created by Michelangelo. And what he did is he had to be put on scaffolding if you've ever been to the Sistine Chapel, it is a significantly tall ceiling. And on scaffolding, he laid on his back and he painted the ceiling one chunk at a time. Then they'd have to take the scaffolding down, move it over a little bit, build it back up. Da Vinci went right back up there and began painting again. It's a remarkable achievement in art. And then the School of Athens, we already went over that. That's Raphael. So you have three geniuses of Renaissance art specifically. Now, we're also going to have incredible writing come out of this time period. So Machiavelli, you've probably heard this term before. 
Machiavelli wrote a book in 1513 called The Prince. And in The Prince came a political ideology that referred to the ends justifying the means. Now, some people see that as a pretty awful way of governing. Others see it as the way to achieve goals. And what the ends justify the means is implying is that you can lie, cheat, steal and do whatever you want to get into a position of power as long as what you do in power ultimately benefits everybody else. So you can do all kinds of terrible things as long as the end results justify the path you took to get there. And this is a book that is still referred to today and it's used on both sides to make an argument. One side would say this isn't how business should be done. The other side would argue this is how business is done in order to get things achieved. Now the Renaissance was incredibly successful in Italy, so that's why it moves north into Europe. It's going to move into Germany, it's going to move into France, it's going to move into England, Holland. Most of Europe is going to have the Renaissance as a motivation to go away from feudalism. So that's an important thing to understand that this transition takes place out of feudalism into the Renaissance. Now, we also have a ton of genius writers at this time period. One. What we're going to talk about right off the bat here is Rabelais. He was a French author who wrote Gargantuan and Pantagruel. That was a very famous uh, book at that time period. Obviously, the next one you know, old Billy Shakespeare here. He's written quite a few things and invented every single writing narrative that you could come up with. In the same way that the Beatles played every chord in rock music, you have uh, William Shakespeare who essentially created every narrative that is still used today. The Lion King is Hamlet. Ten Things I Hate About You is The Taming of the Shrew. You've got all of these uh, themes that were created by uh, Shakespeare during this time period, and they're all borrowing still today from those concepts of Shakespeare. Okay, next up, we've got Cervantes. I've already mentioned Don Quixote once during our lectures, and that was because when I was talking about chivalry, once the Middle Ages are over, then you start making fun of the past, and one of the ways to make fun of the past was to make fun of chivalry. So Cervantes wrote Don Quixote, and that was making fun of chivalry. So rather than riding a horse, he's riding a donkey. His armor doesn't fit. He's kind of a goofball. He's kind of a moron. So what they're doing is they're making fun of that old feudal triangle and the knights that existed in it.